Welcome to Freethinker Radio. I'm Micah Jackson here with my good friend Derek Bros. How you guys doing? It is Wednesday, August. Wait, nope, September eighth. <laughs> we always get the date wrong just to keep you on your toes. <laughs> yeah, we're making sure you guys are paying attention. But it's September eighth, Wednesday, and you're probably listening to this on a Thursday or sometime after Thursday. Um, we're gonna stick with the Monday days, but both of us are busy, so here and there it might be off uh, once every now and then, and we hope you guys will be okay with that. There's still lots of information that we want to pass on to you, both what's happening in the Houston activist world uh, with the Houston Freethinkers and other groups and other projects, as well as news from around the world, and just hopefully some inspiration for you in your own life. And I want to remind you guys to please like Freethinker Radio on Facebook. You can keep up with uh, our upcoming shows, our podcasts, the videos on the YouTube channel. The, the videos of this this show can be found on youtube.com slash Houston Freethinkers, so please subscribe to that channel as well. And, and check out the music. Yeah, check out the music as well. Um, like their page. We've featured if you like Ganesha so far. We've featured uh, Fetty Profound. We actually got an interview coming up with him in the second half of the show. I caught up with him a few weeks ago, and we're going to talk with him and hear more about his music. And yeah, we're always looking to highlight local music artists and just in general cool things happening in the world and of course focus on solutions. So as I said, we'll be talking with Fetty Profound in just a few minutes. So we're going to cover a good amount of news and this week is 9-11 so we will be spending a good amount of time talking about some different aspects of the September 11th attacks of 2001. But first we're going to start off with some local news. One of the things that came across my view here is from the Houston Chronicle, and it's titled, Reports Warn of Finance Trouble. Uh, and groups say it's time to address the pension cost. The time to address the pension cost is now. Some city leaders have spent years standing in the town square hollering themselves hoarse that Houston's financial footing is unstable, that huge pension costs threaten the city's future ability to police the streets, pick up trash, and maintain parks. In recent weeks, they've joined... They've been joined by two others with Bullhorns, the Greater Houston Partnership and the Arnold Foundation. The region's most influential business group and one of its best-funded think tanks each has released a formal paper focusing on city finances and pensions, arguing in varying degrees that action, or at least an honest discussion of the way forward, is urgently needed. Um, and I've heard about this uh, here and there from going to city council, just heard about this looming um, you know, deficit that the city's facing, and like they said in this, that you know, we might not have to have trash or... Uh, police the streets and maintain the parks um, there's definitely probably some you know some city politicians to be blamed for this from my experience the more you do digging around Houston you see how much power and influence the real estate developers and city planners have around and I guess this is probably not just in Houston but definitely there's a lot of contracts being made business deals being made and uh, I feel like what about promises to promises to pensioners I mean that's like a making this whole plan of what the future is going to be and assuming that they can afford it and making promises to people that if you do this job for 30 years, we're going to give you this much. Just the same problem we saw with the the um, big three automakers, you know, and this pulling them down. Uh, I, I imagine that's going on across the nation, too, as uh, municipalities struggle to afford those things. I, I think it's an important question that is often overlooked, like what is owed where and, you know, I don't know, but that 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 keeps coming up in my mind, mm -hmm. I, and nobody really ever seems to talk about that. So I was wondering, maybe your take on that. Uh, it reminds bit. me of the fi 2008 financial crisis, basically, just like you know. It, now I'm not saying it's the exact situation, but where a group of people will more than likely benefit. I mean, because I imagine that the reason, like you said, the pensioners aren't going to get their pensions is because someone's doing some shady dealing, and people are made promises, and money's not going to come through, and so they're saying that you know this, this sort of scare situation of oh, we might not have trash men and police and this and that. Um, which I think outside of looking at the aspect of people losing their money, which is a horrible situation and it's, and it's, it's, it sucks that that's the way things uh, seem to go in this. I think it also prevents a, presents an opportunity for the community to like, okay, cut they're saying, cost. well, we cut costs, but also let's show them like, okay, well, so the city stops picking up our trash, but that doesn't mean that we stop taking care of our community. Yeah, we're, you know? we're just going to want to be dirty or something. Have yeah, just, and that's, I think it's a it's an interesting... But there's also other things. I mean, there's, uh, a, there's a lot Free of... Houston brought the point that they're spending uh, $4 million or something every four years on that you know that's just one of many five things. million dollars over five years yeah that's just one of many things maybe the houston police are spending a lot of time on things that we don't need to worry about i mm -hmm. don't know and maybe those things need to be looked well, there's at there's also the cost been this, of that. like he, this little scandal that's been going on recently where uh the city passed a bill and i don't know when it was passed but it's basically to ban um using cell phones in school zones so they set up 
I think they've already installed the signs. I was reading an article, but I kind of skimmed through it. And it's basically the original writer of the bill is saying it wasn't meant to be optional, but it's like a thing that the city passed, and you know, I'm sure money went into the whole process, but they don't enforce it. It's not on the books, and like the mayor's just like, I'm not interested. I don't think it's worth us to make put up signs to tell people that it's illegal to do that. So it kind of goes unenforced, but there's just misallocation of funds and like wasted funds. Um, so we have a quote right here from Rice University political scientist Mark Jones says. It's critical that Houston voters and elites be aware of the grave financial situation Houston is in and at least part in part choose the next mayor based on that mayor's capacity to address these significant financial problems. At a minimum, the Greater Houston Partnership and the Arnold Foundation are preventing the candidates from avoiding the discussion of city finances. So, of course, the city elections uh, are coming up November 3rd. I uh, I guess we could talk, mention you know some other things locally that we've been involved with. This past week, I went to a... Um, it's an environmental forum for city council candidates. So coming up, the elections in Houston and uh, are focused on city council members at the at-large positions, which are the more powerful positions, and the mayor, Mayor Anise Parker, who we've had quite some experience with over the past few years. Those positions are up for election. And if you're concerned with local politics and you want to get involved in that way, I recommend there's upcoming forums where you have the opportunity to go there and ask questions. Like I said, the last one was environmental. To me, it was... It was kind of a, a BS show. I mean, like, example of the question they asked, and there was a bunch of questions, but it was it was just a bunch of pandering from what I saw. Like, for example, the, one of the questions was, oh, how did the candidates get here today? And so they're all trying to be the, as green as possible. Like, oh, I rode my bike. Oh, I carpooled. Oh, I rode my, I, I drove my car, but this morning I didn't use plastic. Just all this stupid stuff that it was just, I don't know, it was just silly. To me, it just seemed so superficial, you know. And But they did bring up some issues about, Houston's pollution, like in Manchester and the east end parts of town, where a lot of those there's high rates of cancers um, because of these plants and things like that. So I think those are, as far as the environmental um, issues go, that's an interesting one. I was hoping to get asked a question about the environmental uh, costs and issues related to water fluoridation, but was it one was unable to. But this obviously this uh, economic situation brewing locally is something that will need to be dealt with because. We've seen in places like Detroit what happens whenever the city mismanages funds and you know the city falls apart. Definitely, I had a uh, national article that actually kind of ties to that um, you know uh, city decay type theme to some degree. Um, the U.S. police forces uh, as a whole are facing severe shortage of recruits, which kind of you know is a mixed bag, especially if these people are going on to do productive things with their lives. Um, it says that basically the number of applicants down are, 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 is down more than 90% in some cities, and, and most departments uh, from the nation's largest police force in New York City to tiny departments with only five officers, uh, very few people are looking to join the force um, than in years past, and departments of all sizes are being forced to rethink how they fill their ranks. Uh, and they, they say that... Uh, the U.S. unemployment is at a 30-year low for what you think of that, and police recruiters are stymied by the job's low pay, tarnished image, tarnished image, the tarnished image of police officers, it <laughs> says, is affecting their recruiting power. So, you know, if you see the police as they are and it happens to be tarnished, maybe you should get that word out. Increasingly tougher standards for new recruits and job, limited job flexibility. I mean, you don't have much else to do, I guess, if you're depending where you go in there. Um, and these are some uh, statements that recruiters made. Uh, Chicago Police Department recruiter says, you just don't move in a p police department the way you would, like, in a dot-com. And um, the Seattle police recruiter, Jim Ritter, said, you can get shot for 40000 or be home at your, with your family for 60000 So, you know, those are things to think about. And as you hear about more of these anti-recruit efforts across campuses where they train cadets in ROTC and in those cities where that's a prominent uh, business. And even I've seen these people at the uh, uh, malls before, you know, just getting the word out to people about, like, what other options they might have to be, you know, all they can be. And things like that. So it's kind of interesting to say it, not just hitting military, as you've seen before, but also, you know, uh, these police having, you know, a shortage of recruits. Police departments in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago are all working under 
uh, working harder at recruiting and drawing fewer applicants, but it's also the same in smaller cities such as Leesburg, Virginia, where the number of applicants to the police department has dropped 90% in five years, and Reno, Nevada, which reports a decline of 50% since 1997. A decade ago, there were 3,000 applicants for 10 openings with the Seattle Police, the department says. Now there are 1,000 applicants for 70 positions, a drop of more than 90%. So I was trying to figure that one out because it didn't seem like a drop. So I was trying to figure that one out, but nonetheless. So their numbers are being hurt because of tarnished image. And, um, you know, some would say, I mean, I definitely, I, I think we may have commented on this before, but I think at this point... The country is such is in such a divided place, both politically and because of the cop issue. And you know, people who, like last, okay, we're here in Houston. For those of you who are you know who aren't aware, we're in Houston, which is Harris County, and we had the officer shot just last week. That was shot, like you know, somebody came up and killed him. And so this past week, they had, I think, they crossed the entire nation, but definitely in the city, they had like you know, put up a ribbon, wear a blue ribbon for a flag or wear uh, for a cop or wear blue for a cop. And, you know, I was one of the people asking on Facebook, you know, when are we going to put up ribbons for the, all the people killed by the state and the police, you know, and uh, things like that. And not to diminish the man's death at all in any sense, but, you know, just to put it into perspective, it's like this, I've seen the statistics of like how many people have been killed alone this year by police. And there's like been 12 officers killed by, you know, the other way around. And, you know, death is always, in my eyes, you know, it's, it's always a, a loss. There, you know, there's, there's a people who are suffering because of that death. But... It, it just sucks to see that this whole the whole media and everybody gets behind you know standing up supporting cops um, because of of one death when all these people get killed under these really questionable circumstances and instead of people uniting behind that and asking for you know reforming of the police or some would say abolishing of the police we get division you know and I, and I think that's a a troublesome issue. There were a couple other real quick points that I'd like to make about uh, from that article because I think you're right that you know that. that People see see it from one aspect, especially as uh, more and more of the media is getting out uh, about this stuff, and, and they get very divisive about it. And it's kind of sad because I saw one person finally come around, and they were kind of being one-sided about it, but they came around to saying they didn't like it when the uh, police murdered people or when citizens murdered people, and, you know, mm-hmm. that's pretty much the way it should be. Um Real quick, though, uh, just get some of these stats out. In Springfield, Mississippi, only 75 people applied for the police academy this month. Four years ago, they had over 300. Um, Just signs of decline across the board. In rural rural towns in the south, the number of people showing up to take the written police exam has dropped 80%. In Fairfax County, Virginia, an entrance exam advertisement five years ago would draw 4,000. Now advertisements... uh, analogous ads bring in 300 um so it's it's kind of interesting they go on to talk about how little they get paid and uh you know it's it it's it's pretty interesting because it just kind of gets the facts out about this uh case and this was from truthvoice.com and all these all these articles you'll be able to find at uh freethinker radio on facebook as well as uh um, I think on some we'll put we'll put the links in the description. Um, I want to remind you guys what we've been up to the last week since we spoke before we move on to the rest of the news and get into uh, national news and nine eleven. So after we talked last week, uh, last week's episode of Freethinker Radio, we had our monthly meeting. The Houston Freethinkers. We generally have been really the last year or so we've been meeting at the Midtown Bar and Grill off West Gray and Montrose. Uh, we're always upstairs. First Thursday or second Thursday, just keep up with the Houston Freethinkers Facebook page or Freethinker Radio, and you'll see us posting about that. But essentially, we just meet every month and uh, introduce ourselves to the new people. Anybody, people talk about briefly what they care about and what you know, what issues they're focused on and what they're motivated by, and then we try to open it up to, you know, a public public calendar. Basically, we create a calendar of events, and people suggest events they know about or events they're putting on and that they want to promote. And we just sit there and talk and try to figure out what everybody's concerned about and what areas we can focus on. And so we, I'd, I'd say we had a pretty productive meeting. And it was a very productive weekend as well. On Friday, the Friday after the meeting, we had a potluck and a documentary screening um, of the documentary Cowspiracy. Um, Cowspiracy, like it sounds. And uh, I, I think it's a very informative documentary. You know, we, the potluck was a vegan potluck. So by the end of this documentary, the guy who it's following, his, you know, his conclusion is... He needs to become vegan, and I think I encourage everyone to watch it, whether or not you know you feel drawn to that conclusion or not. Because what I think is important in terms of this movie is 
it shows his path where, you know, basically in the beginning he says, you know, after Al Gore's movie Inconvenient Truth came out, I was, you know, awakened to all these problems with the environment and whatever your opinion is of Al Gore is really irrelevant to the story. Basically, he's just saying, you know, he started to become environmentally conscious and to <clears throat> stop using plastic and turn his lights off and to conserve energy and ride his bike and do all these different things. And then he started to do research and to look up the biggest uh, causes of degradation to the environment and pollution and all these different problems, rainforest, deforestation, and uh, many issues, and, you know, comes to find that really the largest contributing factor is animal agriculture and mass factory farming and dairy farms, just the amount of space that it takes to graze a cow. And um, then he goes to the, you know, all your big name environmental organizations, Sierra Club, Rainforest Action Network, uh, 360, whatever, you know, all these different environmental groups goes and checks their website and finds that none of them address the issue at all. None of this, none of them at all list animal agriculture. Instead, they focus on the human things you can do, which are, like I said, turn off your lights, not use plastic bags. And when he, you know, he does the statistics and shows this is how much you save when you do these things and how it doesn't even compare to how much, you know, just one hamburger will, you know, counteract all that. So um, he decides to start setting up interviews and some of them decline others you know he gets them on camera and just asks them these questions and when confronted and asks like so how come you guys list this and that but not the number one cause of this most of them admit openly that the cattle lobby the farming industry is just too strong that lobby is so strong that if you start talking to people about their diet they're more than likely not going to listen so that's to me a, a indicative of a this what one of my friends calls the nonprofit industrial complex, where these organizations that maybe from the beginning start grassroots to to go after a particular uh, cause, then after a while they become entrenched, and then they seek to just sort of maintain their existence. You know, so is it's not really it's easier for them to say like, hey, you know, stop using plastic bags and sign our petitions and you know build up a whole revenue stream and get a crew of people, because it's a controversial position to say, hey, your diet is what's causing all these problems. You know, so. Again, whether or not you um, think that, well, that means you should be vegan or just you want to become more conscious in your diet, I think it's uh, it's really eye-opening to see just the failures of a lot of these so-called environmental movements and um, their inability to, to look at the real issue of what's causing harm to the, the environment. So, yeah, check that out. You can find it all, you can find it online. It's called Cowspiracy. And thanks to everybody who came out and checked that. We had some good food as well. And the next morning, I was super excited. We had a great, amazing turnout at the last organic outpost. Um, I think we had about 10 to 15 different people who came throughout the afternoon. We were there at 9 a.m. We were leveling a bunch of ground. We were pulling up weeds. Um, we were, we'd planned to do some planting, but it just wasn't the season. We found out that on the coming 19th, two weeks from now, or next, next Saturday, actually, the 19th, if you're in the city, come to the last organic outpost. They're going to have a full day of building out a garden. It's, it's crazy, Mikey. you got to see it. They have, like, now they have this master plan. they got an engineer and architecture to come design this master plan. So they're going to be completely demolishing a whole lot of it, setting new paths, which in a lot of ways is, like, I told Farmer Joe, who's the guy who maintains most of it, that I'm like, well, I'm a little sad to see some of the, you know, spontaneous order go to a more structured system. But in the end, if, it, if they maximize their space and what they're able to produce, then it will become sustainable rather than just, like, so chaotic that, you know, they're all just running around working their asses <coughs> off and not able to survive so from that you know perspective i definitely want this to happen so they need a lot of help it's like you come and you can pay ten dollars and you can volunteer for free of course and work but if you pay ten dollars then you'll get like a, a lunch because it's uh, they're trying to have like a full day event and you can come as long as you can you pay ten bucks that goes towards the farm and you get a bunch of food and you get to help out in putting this design into into reality and yeah, we had a good time on Saturday. And I think that we're going to have probably a regular crew of people going back now. And the 19th will be the big day for building those beds and planting stuff. So if you want to get involved in that, go to the last organic outpost. You can find them on Facebook as well. And uh, last little event that we had bef since we talked to you last, uh, some of us are involved in a group called the Houston Radical Book Club, which you can also find on Facebook. And basically just a group of people who are hoping to explore all sorts of literature from philosophy to fiction to politics whatever it may be uh, and last night we had our first meeting on a, a book called the new libertarian manifesto and people you know bringing up points that they disagreed with or asking questions about parts they didn't understand i, I thought it was a really productive discussion and we're going to be meeting again in a couple weeks to continue that discussion and then i think after that we'll switch books and that's kind of the the 
I think we're going to go for that. Just have a couple weeks on each book and move around. But yeah, lots of good stuff happening. Uh, looking forward later to this month, like I said, the 19th at the last organic outpost. And September 24th will be the second gathering of Houston Soup, Super Houston, the crowdfunding campaign. We'll tell you more about that as it gets closer. But for those of you who are interested, lots of good things coming up. And you can find all this at the Houston Freethinkers and on the Freethinker Radio Facebook pages. Yeah, Saturday I, I checked out the Heights uh, Epicurean Market. It's the only farmer's market in the Heights, so I was on the other end of uh, some of that uh, good food stuff and those gluten-free cookies uh, <laughs> that you were eating earlier, Derek, I brought from there. So that was really nice. They had a band that we've worked with before uh, play there, and they had so many, you know, just not their non-GMO, gluten-free stuff. So it's really... Uh, uh, a nice experience and the people were so friendly I'm sure I probably picked up some vendors that we can work with there as well um, so that's really fun and if you're not in Houston and can't visit the Lou I, I advise you to please try to check out a farmer's market even if you don't go there all the time they're, they they make a difference and we detailed some of those facts a couple episodes back um, and uh, also we had a really nice uh, music event that evening that a lot of people came out to a little different than uh, your typical uh, loud and rowdy show but it had its fair share of uh, uh, movement to say the least so uh, that was a lot of fun and uh, I'm sure there are a lot more things going on throughout Houston and across uh, Texas as well as uh, the world so it's good to get out you know see things and do things and um, we're lucky in Houston because there's a lot of things we can do we got a lot of uh, difficulties in such a big crowded funky place with cameras and stuff like that but there's a lot of good people and i swear every day we go out or do something we're meeting more and i think it holds true for pretty much anybody that ever hears this that you know if you start not thinking that's the way the world is you're probably not alone in that thought or just alone you know so find something you dig and get out and do it i don't even care if it's as cheesy and simple as going to a movie it's important to get out and do things go find something talk to a stranger you know get out of your box little things like that can change the world it might seem trite but you know we talk about a lot of heavy stuff on here but i never want to undermine or under emphasize you know how much of the uh freedom revolution is just part of your day-to-day life and how you feel about it so if things are cramping you you know you might want to check out why so should we keep moving should we keep moving are we losing things are we out of power have we just been talking we're at 22 minutes we're at 22 minutes well i'd like to thank everybody out there at 22 minutes for (laughs) listening in and sharing uh free thinker radio we're just going to get back into our game here and uh that's kind of what we're doing here taking it easy moving through articles just finding finding how we want to work the program now and uh once we're uh, really running along we're going to step things up and we hope to bring all y'all along with us and uh have a lot of fun and exciting things in the past uh it's kind of sad that we don't have our history but in the past we've interviewed uh presidential candidates uh um, judges uh musicians Authors, movie makers, uh, who am I forgetting? We've got to have in, interviewed. We over interviewed uh, former Secretary of the Treasury, Paul Craig Roberts. He yeah. Was tre- yeah. Was Secretary of Treasury under um, Ronald Reagan. He's yeah. a really insightful guy. We'll try to get him back on soon. So what other news you want got you want to dive into before we get well, into 9-11? Yeah, we, uh, I know we've got a lot to talk about. 9-11 is such a giant can of worms, to say the least. You know, we're talking about, you know, some of the difficulties in meeting budget and just the swollen bureaucracies in a way. One that hit my uh, radar was this one that came out, it was headline that went across saying 307,000 veterans may have died awaiting Veterans Affairs health care. I'm a veteran myself. I don't think I'd ever go to the VA if I could ever help it. Um, I just <coughs> don't think I could. I've already been through that craziness. But it's basically hundreds of thousands of veterans listed in the Department of Veteran Affairs enrollment system died before their applications for care were processed. This is all according to a report uh, they issued Wednesday. Um, This article is from CNN Politics. The VA's inspector general found that out of about 800,000 records stalled in the agency system for managing health care enrollment, there are more than 307,000, that's close to half, uh, records that belong to veterans who had died months or even years in the past. The inspector general said, due to limitations in the system's data, the number of records did not necessarily represent uh, veterans actively seeking enrollment in VA health care. In a response to a request by the House Committee on Veterans Affairs to investigate a whistleblower's allegation, see how important whistleblowers are, of mismanagement at the VA's Health Eligibility Center, 
The inspector general also found VA staffers incorrectly marked unprocessed applications and may have deleted 10,000 or more records in the last five years. In the last five years alone. Anyway, I added that alone just because, you know, for emphasis and stuff, you know. In one case, a veteran who applied for VA care in 1998 was placed in a pending status for 14 years. You know what's kind of sucky is when you got to do things in the military, you can't put them on a pending status and say, I'll get back to you after my retirement comes in. No, they make you go out there and just have a miserable life. Anyway, <laughs> another veteran. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to be that funny, but we all we all know what's up. Another <laughs> veteran who passed away in 1988 was found to have an unprocessed record lingering in 2014. For more than a year, CNN investigated and reported on veterans' deaths and delays at VA facilities across the country, including detailed investigations November 2013 uh, and uh, 2014, examining deaths at VA facilities in South Carolina and Georgia. So, you know, this is just another example. More and more people going into the military, less and less ability to take care of them. Um, fighting the wars of empire generate a lot of hurt and messed up people, you know. Um, luckily, I just wouldn't look for a solution there, but I know a lot of people that are veterans and they don't have much other choice, or they just believe it's a, you know, part of the deal that they made with this thing, just like the people with the um, pensions believe it's part of the deal. So, it just seems like a lot of government deals just don't seem to hold a lot of water when it comes down to them holding their end. And maybe it's because they make projections made on, I don't know, imagination or something. Hmm. Imagination land where government, <laughs> government <budget>. promises things <laughs> and yep. doesn't deliver. And you believe in them. <laughs> you know, get, get over it. It's just, I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, we got to hold a standard, but I think what would be better is imagine there were less people going in to get shot up to need care you know we can make a difference so i guess that's kind of uh you know yeah we need to clean it up but at the same time just the existence of such a bloated bureaucracy is part of the problem you know so absolutely so what else you got Oh, one last thing. They say that they have VA staffers also. I was trying to keep it short, but they also found that the VA staffers hid applications for care. So that's that's pretty... I think that's almost criminal, you know what I'm saying? I mean, goodness gracious. Oh, I got all over the place, you know. It depends where we want to go. There's a... I thought this one was kind of interesting from Reason.com, and I don't want to get too far into it. Basically, um, a 17-year-old was caught in a sexting scandal, and he now faces uh, charges of ex sexually exploiting a minor that could land him in jail for up to 10 years. Um, since the law considers him an adult, but one of the minors, one of the minors he supposedly exploited that was himself. So basically, he and his underage girlfriend, they were both 16 at the time, sent each other pictures back and forth. So now he is uh, facing two counts of second-degree sexual exploitation and three counts of third-degree exploitation. What's strange is that uh, his, uh, he's basically a high schooler, um, and uh, it's funny because he is legally allowed to have sex with his girlfriend, but not to sext her, okay? And um, it goes on to be even a little bit more weird. Uh, so him and his girlfriend... And it names them are like other teenagers, you know, they're starting to wonder about sex and be interested in it and all that stuff. And uh, nobody had any problem on it, it seems, until local authorities searched uh, the gentleman Co Copenings, Copenings uh, <laughs> phone and discovered them. Why did they search his phone is not clear. Uh, local news reports claim that it had nothing to do with the sex themselves. Rumble Island County Sheriff's Office did not respond for any request to about that. Um, and there is no record of a search warrant, according to uh, found, uh, the countyobserver.com. There's no is record of a search warrant being issued for his phone. So that brings in, you know, we can think about it for many different ways, but it boils down to a violation of his you know, person or papers, you know. So it's a Fourth Amendment violation, it seems, with no evidence of a warrant being issued, et cetera, and no motivation to search his phone. Nonetheless, you know, these things are on there from when he was 16 years old. Both teens were charged with sexual exploitation, and uh, the, uh, the, the girl pled guilty to a lesser charge and was given 12 months probation. 
basically, this is, I think this is ludicrous. I don't know about you, but it's really, it's really interesting because um, the gentleman is still facing two counts of sexual degree exploitation and uh, the third degree charges, which constitute the majority of the total charges, actually stem only from the pictures he had of himself. And the implication is clear. He does not own himself from the standpoint of the law. He is not free to keep sexually provocative pictures even if they depict his own body. So I don't know, this is kind of a freedom question. Is this a minor's rights question? I don't know what this is. It's just a jumbled mess, it's chaos. And consider this, North Carolina is one of two states in the country, the other is New York, that considers 16 to be the age of adulthood for criminal purposes. This means, of course, that he can be tried as an adult for exploiting a minor himself. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one, it's pretty crazy. So that's, that's laws straightening things out for you and protecting people. And that's what you get, you know, the laws pass to protect you and they pass more laws. To me, I think what, something that really bothers me is when I see like people calling for more laws when it's like, and it'll be a very specific like, oh, we need to protect this specific group when there's already a law that exists. It's just the government's failing to enforce it. And, you know, so the solution then that some people would propose is more government. And government's always re reactive to what's happening, it seems. Like, I imagine when this law was written, sexting, you know, wasn't an issue. You see what I'm saying? So... It's it's frustrating. I'm sure it's all with good intentions, but in the end, we're still left with results like we've been discussing. So I'm not exactly sure where we go from there. I'm sure those things have to be amended in their states if you want to go through the legal process. In the meantime, a lot of money and time and efforts being spent to prosecute someone for exploiting themselves. Yeah. Well, as we move into 9-11 news, there's a couple of different issues that I want to cover different aspects of this, because this is the 14th anniversary of the September 11th attacks, 2001. I was 17 years old when that happened. I was uh, ending my high school career, and for the first few years after that, I think I even remember in 2003 when we first started dropping bombs on uh, Saddam the second time, that uh, I, I even remember having this moment of like being with my girlfriend and like having been propagandized, you know, about all that stuff, and just thinking, like, watching it on TV as they were showing, the, you know, the stuff dropping, like, oh, we're, look, we're getting these bad guys. It's, like, crazy watching this, like, war launch, right? But then within a year or so, I really quickly woke up to, uh, I guess, just all the anti-Bush fever at the time. But it took a little while longer for me to realize that, you know, John Kerry was no better and things like that. And so here we are 14 years later, you know, a whole president later. And, um, you know, one of the first things I want to talk about is this article from Newsweek, and it's 14 years later, and the alleged accused masterminds, the five men who are accused of planning this, have not been tried, you know, have not. And one thing that I've seen a lot with 9-11 is, you know, when you try to talk to people about, you know, how the, the people in Guantanamo are treated, or making sure that we give the you know, the accused masterminds of 9-11, some type of rights or just even fair, just treatment that every person expects from America that, you know, I get comments like everything I needed to l know about Islam or about those people I learned on 9-11, you know, basically just like let them hang, leave them out to dry kind of attitude. And to me, it's just, it's scary because it just shows how quick like a nation can profess to be about certain principles and ideas, but very quickly be willing to, you know, change those principles based on a particular group of people and of course a lot of this has to do with the act of 9-11 and what these men are accused of doing um, but still I think I just find that to be scary and I've followed this, this, uh, their, their situation for quite a while and I'm telling you these five men have not only does the supposed mastermind Khalid Sheikh Mohammed chaos, KSM have was he you know waterboarded over a hundred times before he confessed to this and his you know his confession these other men also, as they're trying to build up any type of defense, the lawyers that are actually trying to defend them, several of them have quit because there's been in, in, uh, incidents where they realize that one member of the defense team was actually a, a mole that had been working for the FBI that was trying to like get information on the clients. And then there was another incident where they realized that there was a listening device that implanted in the room where he was meeting with the clients. And then apparently there's in the courtroom in Guantanamo, there's a third party, and this was never explained, but a third party was apparently allowed to, had control of the microphones and things like that, and was able to silence the microphone while one of them was speaking, but it wasn't the judge, and the judge basically reprimanded and said, like, whoever has control of my courtroom needs to, you know, back out. Like, really weird, creepy situations that make it perfectly clear that these men are never going to get a fair trial, and again, maybe some people don't think they deserve that, 
But I think for the biggest terrorist attack in, on American soil with nearly 3,000 lives lost and all these things that we, sh- you know, people should be trying to get every single detail of what went wrong and like, you know, what these guys were involved in and all this stuff, but it's just been pushed off and pushed off and pushed off. And, um, you know, and most of America has moved on and forgotten and, you know, they're going to face the death penalty whenever this trial does start. But it's just insane to me um, that, you know, that the, the, their rights are basically, whatever rights do exist, are being taken away. And this is interesting here. In Newsweek writes, in a strict sense, the Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial probably does not apply to the 9-11-5, though the rules of several contemporary war crime tribunals have included such a right. But the fairness concerns underlying this constitutional bulwark remain central to the 9-11 case, especially since the trial will be a showcase of American justice. Another thing is this, no reporters are allowed to attend this trial. The reporters that are able to attend, they're basically put in another room where there's a time delay of several minutes. Um, and it won't be televised on TV or anything for like any other major trial. So they're definitely keeping the whole thing tightly under wraps and just for comparison it took less than a year after world war ii for nearly two dozen nazi war crime defendants to be tried by a military tribunal at nuremberg um as by contrast as president obama put in a speech seven years ago the guantanamo prosecute prosecutions have met setback <clears throat> after setback and the cases have lingered on of course obama has done nothing to change that um and yeah I, I, we're going to put these links in there so you can read more in depth about this case i definitely recommend like i said there's so many different things that have happened to these this case where it's obvious they're not going to get any sort of fair trial or have any sort of ability to communicate and have uh, attorney-client privilege. Um, and this, you know, as we're progressing through this, you're going to see, I guess, more of my thoughts on 9-11. But I think in general, even from the mainstream perspective, there is obvious questions about 9-11. But I will hold off on those for just a moment. Uh, you know, what are, your, what are your thoughts, Mike, as far as the idea of the Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial for these men? Well, all the all the Constitution really does is recognize the rights of humans, not give them to them. So I would say that it's darn right un-American not to recognize the rights of these men. And furthermore, I'd say that it's hard to stand the uh, moral high ground if you don't, you know, act morally to people and with people. And in what time, what other times? And as you said, like, you know, Nuremberg, and also even in our own revolution, people were put to, on trial. I believe the people, the British soldiers who uh, fired at the Boston Massacre were put on trial in Boston. And uh, I think, you know, once you lose that, it's, uh, it's, you know, a real travesty. And that's why, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, between that and the Patriot Act, the terrorist won. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's exactly... You're going to sit back and let that happen. (laughs) That's where we're (laughs) headed right here. This next article uh, touches on just that very sentiment. It's from thenation.com titled 14 Years After 9-11, The War on Terror is Accomplishing Everything That Bin Laden Hoped That was really well written. And, yeah, it's a great great piece here. The nation does do tend to do good work. Um, but, yeah, just really looking into all the things, as Micah said, the Patriot Act. People have said this since the beginning. You know, if, the, if the terrorists hated us for our freedom, then they've already won because a lot of those freedoms have been stripped away, or at least now you're monitored at every turn. So, I mean, I've come to find that a society cannot truly be free without privacy, the right to privacy. I mean, if you think about the Nazis and other, uh, you know, totalitarian governments, when they have the right to come in your house whenever the hell they want, you're not free. And if you if you don't have the right to a private conversation, then you're not free, you know, in a lot of ways. It, it really limits you. And you look at the growth of the home, Department of Homeland Security, um, like this article touches on, we've got... Uh, 14 years of our wars coming home in the form of PTSD, the militarization of the police, the spread of war zone technology like drones and stingrays to the homeland. 14 years of that un-American word homeland. 14 years of the expansion of surveillance of every kind and of the development of a global system whose reach from foreign leaders to tribal groups in the backlands of the planet would have stunned those running the totalitarian states of the 20th century. 14 years of the financial starvation of America's infrastructure and still not a single mile of high-speed rail built anywhere in the country. 14 years in which to launch Afghan War 2.0, Iraq Wars 2.0 and 3.0, Syria War 1.0. 14 years, that is, of the improbable made probable. Um, I mean, he's making great points here. This is, And this is often what I try to get people to at least look at is whether or not you take your um, you know, research or thoughts on 9-11 far enough to ask, why don't we know the truth about the funding of it? Just looking at the effects of 9-11, you know, everything that oh, Edward Snowden has revealed, everything that we've seen since the, the Patriot Act and since all these things, this eternal wars that are going on, um, this Islamophobia and propaganda that the, the state and the media, 
the you know obedient media uses to propagandize us to continue to support war campaigns. I saw a great article earlier that was basically describing the differences between you know the anti-war movements of the past and anti-war musicians and just how many of them were outspoken in public about those things and saying like where are today's openly uh, you know anti-war musicians and and public officials. You know there was a couple of weeks ago there was like an article where or there was a basically Modest Yahoo, the well-known. Uh, reggae musician who was a former former Hasidic Jew and still has a pretty big Jewish following was scheduled to play a festival in Spain but he was removed after he refused to take a position on Israel um, and basically said that he you know doesn't get involved in politics but I think you know when looking at his music which talks about peace and freedom all these things it's it's you can't say you're not political you know and you and I think that you know, not to say that should be a barometer, but for a lot of people it is. For a lot of people, you know, with whether or not they're going to endorse a candidate, where do they stand on Israel? Do they consider, like, what Israel is doing to the Palestinians to be, you know, fair? Why, you know, it, that gets into a whole other situation. But my point is basically people, uh, people make allowances for these things. And we've seen more and more of this with, after 9-11. People are willing to accept this state of war. And I mean, and it's sad because it's just there's another. There's a, like right now we're we're dropping drone bombs on Yemen, Somalia. Uh, we're still involved in campaigns in Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, all these different things. And it's just it's just continuing to grow, you know. And it's it's hard to really wrap your mind around it. But this is this piece does a really good job of reminding us of what the last 14 years uh, of life in the United States has looked like. Well, the president being a, an assassin in chief, his global kill list endlessly targeted the backlands of the planet with our grim reaper and predator, thank you Hollywood drones, armed with hellfire missiles, and that Washington has regularly knocked off women and children while searching for militant leaders and generic followers. Yeah, yeah this, this is a good piece. Absolutely check this out. I mean, it's definitely, it's probably one that we should have just read, but it's long and it makes a lot of good points. And it talks about, you know, it does it does do the same assumption, you know, that uh, bin Laden's the call, cause of it and um, so on. But despite that, you know, it, it points out a lot of just the flat-out effects and how much we've changed, no matter what you think about 9-11, how much that single event has changed and redirected resources, mindset... With all the military contractors, it just goes on and gives you facts after facts, and it's written in prose practically by, I go ahead and give this guy a shout out, Tom Englehart, because this is a good piece. So uh, check that one out. So you're going to New York, uh, Derek? Yeah, I'm headed actually to New York this Thursday after, uh, Thursday morning, early morning, because um, every year, pretty much since 2003, 2004, there have been events in New York and around the country for people who continue to research various aspects of 9-11 that um, we don't have answers for. And this includes everyone from first responders, firefighters, <clears throat> to family members. Actually, about an hour ago, I got a call from the Eric Lawyer, who's the founder of Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, who was in uh, New York Fire Department during the attacks and was there and helps organize a, a lot with the firefighters. They're actually going to be releasing a new documentary this year, which will be playing Friday night in New York City. And just in case anybody happens to be in New York City and hears about this and is interested in those events, you can go to groundzero911.com. But I've been going to, I went to D.C. in 2010, and for the past five years I've been going to New York City to participate in those events. I'm also going to be doing some coverage for Met Press News. Uh, as I said, there's a documentary screening Friday night, and then Saturday there will be a full-day symposium featuring family members, researchers, journalists, and a host of other people who are presenting, uh, you know, questions about the research into 9-11, specifically touching on the 28 pages, which some of you may have heard this. This is kind of a big thing for those who question 9-11 to have um, a story like this become so mainstream. And this is basically, there after 9-11, there was a Senate report on the events of 9-11. It was several hundred pages long, but there were 28 pages that George W. Bush classified. And even though the family members protested and people who saw it said, like, just, this doesn't need to be classified, it's been classified since then. It was one of the things Obama, Obama campaigned on and promised that he personally, according to the family members, promised them that he was going to make it happen. And, of course, so far there have been no moves on it. And p different supportive uh, congressmen and women have introduced legislation to do that thing, to force the president to declassify that. Several... Uh, congressmen who have seen that, including Thomas Massey, uh, former uh, Congressman Bob, Senator uh, Bob, um, 
Jones, I think. I can't, sorry, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But several congressmen and women who've seen it, first of all, they said in order to go read these 28 pages, they have to go into a private room. They can't bring any recording device or a pen or anything. They just have to go into this like sealed room to view them. And uh, in the words of Thomas Massey, he said, if the American people see this, you know, they'll be shocked. They will, you know, it'll probably inspire anger. Uh, that's Walter Jones, former Senator Walter Jones. That's his name. Is. Uh, he, he says, he's retired now. He says he's seen it. And he says that, it, in his words, it points a strong finger at Saudi Arabia. Now, according to the official story that the government says that this was, um, as Micah said, this was done by Osama bin Laden and 19 hijackers who, you know, were, they planned this in the caves of Af Afghanistan. But there has long since the beginning of 9-11 been calls saying that, you know, there was funding from, there was wire funding through Pakistan, there was uh, lots of Saudi royalty that was in the country and that had left right before 9-11. So there's a lot of, you know, loose ends here that haven't been explored and aren't explored in the official 9-11 commission report. And the family members have been pursuing this, despite most of the media saying those people who question 9-11 are crazy or should be shunned. Many of these people are family members who from my experience, support these efforts. I'm not going to say they all do, but definitely there are family members who have questions and who are still seeking answers. The 28 pages seems to be a, a way to sort of bring this issue that has been put in the realm of conspiracy back into mainstream politics because there's a bill right now, H.R. 14, House Resolution 14, that was introduced by Rand Paul and Democrats, a bipartisan bill, you know, to support this, but it gets basically no media attention. So, you know, they do it, they try to push it out there, the family members fight for it. Um, and that's going to be a big focus of this weekend's events in New York is looking at the 28 pages, uh, you know, how to make that a bigger issue, how to get the media to focus on that, how to um, get people talking about it. And yeah, so there's, I've, we've got an article there. I wrote one for truthandmedia.com, New York City activist to host Declassify the Truth conference for 9-11 anniversary. I'll post that in the link as well. And you can see all the information. The talks are going to range from discussing ant the anthrax attacks, the secret 28 pages, uh, prosecuting 9-11, psychologists speaking out about people's fear of challenging the official 9-11 story. Uh, so some inf interesting information, and I hope you will look further into that. One last thing I did want to touch on 9-11 before we get close to wrapping up here it has to do with the first responders, which I think is a huge tragedy uh, in relation to this whole situation. I also wrote another article for Truth and Media last year for the anniversary called Six Reasons to Question 9-11. And one of the reasons I say that it's worth questioning is because if you look at the amount of first responders who have cancer and have all these different illnesses, because you imagine like the people that are down there breathing in all that dust and just people in general around New York who have come down with a variety of illnesses, lung problems, health problems, breathing problems, that can be traced to this dust. I mean, you have a building, concrete, bodies, like all this stuff being pulverized when you watch the towers collapse and for some reason they fall very fast, nearly free fall speed and everything turns to dust into a powder and people were breathing that in, you know, for days and for weeks and the volunteers were going down there to help and a lot of them, thousands of them have died of cancer, um, have been uh, diagnosed with cancers. So this report is coming from the host, Huffington Post and it says that John Stewart, the former host of The Daily Show, is apparently going to walk the halls of Congress with 9-11 first responders, asking lawmakers to extend funding to help the heroes. Basically, what John Stewart is going to do is go down to co Congress and try to raise, use his celebrity to raise awareness on this important cause. As I said, most of these men and women have been ignored. There's a documentary out by, um, I can't remember, Mike Feal. He runs the Feel Good Foundation, F-E-A-L, which is his last name. And he was a first responder, and he just basically said, you know, he started seeing all these people die, so he found a, formed a nonprofit to help them get the help they need, you know, connecting to healthcare and all kinds of different things. And he actually put out a documentary called 9-11 Dust or In the Dust or something. I know you can find it online, but it specifically looks at that aspect of how it's affected these first responders. So, you know, and this is the thing as well, looking into some of the 9-11 documentaries, you might, or you might remember, uh, after 9-11, you had the, e the head of the EPA go on television and say, like, oh, the air is safe to breathe. They declared it was safe to breathe for all the first responders, you know. They specifically lied. And now since that time, there's been several attempts to get this bill to pass through, which would guarantee them funding. And I think that's the least to say. Like, I mean, regardless of who's behind 9-11, um, what we can say is these people volunteered to go into that. Yeah, they this were, crazy they were, shit. Yeah, know? they're heroes. You know, they're they went with the purpose of saving people. And most of them, not just as a job, even if it was a job. So, you know, I think that, you know, would, would you say justice for the heroes? I think that's a good 
slogan. I think anybody that uh, remembers uh, 9-11 footage even remembers those clouds of dust just rolling across the whole city, you know, out across there. So I'm glad that you bring that up. Um, because there's so the, the, even the 9-11 commission said there's questions, you know, endless questions around 9-11. So, you know, if, if people don't recognize that and start digging a little deeper, then they may not care about that. But if they think all the answers are in, then, um, you know, they're definitely short sighted, I'd say, because they can't see past 14 years to see how much has changed. I mean, yeah, exactly. And, and I think you made a good point there. If, if the people involved in the 9-11 commission report themselves, have, say that they themselves were stifled, they were blocked access to information, and they, you know, they weren't completely satisfied with the report. I think that says something itself, you know. And members of the report, you can find their statements have come out and said since, and that they believe that, you know, there, there's more to what they were told, and that the 28 pages should be released. And my belief, and I think many other people's belief, is that <clears throat> if these pages do point to Saudi Arabian uh, funding, which of course the United States and the Bush family specifically have close ties to Saudi royalty then this is an ally of the United States that helped fund a terrorist attack. And that, you know, obviously that opens up a huge can of worms that goes into a whole direction. But that is the start of a real invest investigation where I believe then people would start examining, okay, what else were we lied to about 9-11? Or what else, you know, do we need to re-examine? And hopefully pull back everything that we just described has happened over the last 14 years. Yeah, definitely consider how, you know, it's affected what it means to be free and what it means to be you know just stuck living in this country in a way i mean i don't have any problems with the country as a whole people are great there's lots of advantages to being here uh, there's also you know problems and i don't think we need to wait till everything's ruined to bother to make things nice and i think or nicer i should say and you know if this is you know this is one of way one of the ways that you can by helping to shed light on this or be involved in this if it is uh you know, an issue that you take uh, concern with. And if it's not an issue you take concern with, look at all the things that it does affect that probably are an issue that you're concerned with. And I think uh, if people start recognizing that, more and more people would be involved, whether we call it question 9-11 or, you know, question the Patriot Act or question all the effects of 9-11, question, you know, thermite, question buildings falling down, question controlled demolition, you know, whatever you got going on, just start questioning that and finding answers. Um, I think, like I said, it'll all serve the same purpose. So I think some of the things get a little bit extreme here and there, but I think that in the long run, if they can reveal more and more of that and let people know that they don't have to live like this, um, then that would be good because, like I said, you know, we live in a great place and it could be even better. You know, it could actually be free. There, there aren't that many threats. Look how much life has changed. Look how much money is being spent. Look how many alarms and warnings and just who wants to live in that type of state? Yeah, definitely. We want to get out of this. Uh, I call it, you know, it's basically been a fear, a fear mindset, paradigm. Yeah. yeah, that's been created since 9-11. That's that's pretty much all I got as far as 9-11 and news on my end. I definitely want to encourage those of you who are hearing this this week to uh, Friday's 9-11. So, you know, if you have one conversation with one person about any aspect of what we just talked about, whether like, hey, have you thought about how much the world has changed since then? Or, you know, did you know a third building fell on 9-11? Or whatever your approach is, I just think it's important to have that conversation. Play some music. There's lots of 9-11 music out there. Three th nearly 3,000 people died, and I personally feel... Um, some sense of obligation or commitment or want to 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 find the re true reason that they did die and you know who's behind that and I don't believe that we have all those answers so there's some good 9-11 music out there a lot of good 9-11 hip hop and such too right? yeah absolutely you can find all kinds of good music maybe that's what we'll, we'll feature on this episode then yeah throw that sounds, in sounds like a good idea well I do just want to wrap this up it's been a, a good night talking with y'all uh there's a couple of interesting headlines. Uh, China's government has decided to manage public dancing. Uh, too many people were getting annoyed by these people that would come in, set up some music, and start dancing. So now government's got to step in. Stopping the dance parties? Stopping the dance parties in China. You can, you can be glad that here they stopped less of them because <laughs> <laughs> Russia's going back to the moon. There's all kinds of headlines out there. And... Uh, um, you know, I got a couple of these culture stories that I'm eventually going to get to with you people. <laughs> so uh, I hope you all have a great time. Please share and like uh, this uh, video if you do. And uh, stay tuned. We're going to have more and more stuff coming to you all and more and more developed content. So thank you much for the listen. Yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. We will be back next week. And if uh, 
if, it, if everything goes well, we'll be featuring some interviews from 9-11, from New York and 9-11, and just some more interesting content coming your way. Thank you guys for listening. As always, if you can hear this, you are the resistance. Live free, think free, and you will be free. And I'm talking with a new friend here. I wanted to bring you bring you the story of someone who inspired me earlier. I got to hear his music. And if you listen to my work, you follow my work, you know that I believe that we're going to really affect change, not only by having the philosophical revolution, the mental revolution, but by connecting with people through music and through the arts and getting involved in the community and spreading the message that way. So anytime I hear somebody who's doing music that's not just pushing the mainstream narrative or just telling people just to get fucked up and just party and just you know ignore and all that kind of stuff you know but to try to empower people yeah. i want i want to highlight that so first of all tell us tell us who you are tell us what you're about all right well uh my hip-hop handle is uh fetty profound and i've been doing music in the phoenix metro area since like man since high school honestly but uh uh, my first like uh, breakthrough was kind of like 2006 when the Phoenix New Times wrote about me, and that was kind of like my my breakthrough. Um, but as I've uh, developed and progressed as a person um, in just the knowledge, you know, esoteric knowledge, and uh, you know what's going on with the world, and um, as I've researched those types of things, you know, it, it progressed my music to a different level as I've become awake as a person. You know, when I first started uh, rhyming, I was just an unconscious, you know, what I refer to as sheeple, you know what I mean, to be honest with you. Um, and I was just kind of like that. And then uh, as I've, you know, learned a lot and, um, you know, looked into, you know, things that are going on around us, uh, I realized that, you know, if I'm going to be making music, uh, it should be of relevant content that's important um, for the next generation to hear and observe for some type of change in the world, pretty much. So, so how would you describe your music? You know, what and and what terms? I mean, obviously, it's not it's not just standard like hip hop, and it definitely sounds from what I heard earlier, it sounds more like you you like you said poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what I consider myself first and foremost because uh, you know you get uh, stuck into these labels, and I, I think that's what the major problem with society. I mean, that's a huge problem with society, in my opinion, is how everybody wants to label something. You're a Republican, you're a Democrat. Well, why can't you have Republican thoughts and Democratic thoughts at the same time? Of course, you can. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, when people say I'm a rapper, uh, that comes with the connotation of like, fuck bitches, get money. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, I'm not that rapper anymore. And uh, so I consider myself a poet, you know, that's what it's, uh, it's been like about to me uh, from the day, from very, from very beginning, you know? So, you know, who are some of your, your inspirations? Because I'm, especially on the Conscious Resistance on our channel and on the website, I'm always trying to do like a weekly spotlight of musicians of all genres who are doing, you know, putting out there that positive content, getting people thinking, looking outside the box. What are some of your inspirations? Man, you know, uh, the thing is, is even uh, I feel like uh, rap music back in the day when it was less commercialized and unsensationalized and, you know, it wasn't so mainstream, a lot of those artists had relevant content that they were talking about, especially in their communities. They weren't really looking at it, I feel, as like a worldly aspect. It was more like, in my community, this is what's happening to me. And so, you know, back in the day, artists like, you know, Tupac Shakur, gotta give him love, um, you know, uh, uh, even the mainstream in, back in the day was great music. Uh, these days, you kind of have to dig to find the right the, the the people that will influence you. And today, I think if I had to pick some people, Immortal Technique would be a huge um, influence for me, as well as um, I really feel this uh, rapper named Locksmith. Uh, I think you should look into him, man. He's uh, a poet, um, and I just think that there's a lot of good musicians out there. You just have to dig for them. You know what I mean? It's not as simple to find them any longer. But um, you know, my favorite artist of all time is Otis Redding. He's not even hip hop. He's my favorite artist of all time. I consider him the greatest musician of all time. Um, behind him, you know, I really love Tupac. I mean, I'm really influenced by him. And, you know, uh, it seems strange that a white person would be into Tupac as much as me, but uh, I think that, you know, if you look at, like, the Black Panther Party and a lot of things that they were saying, they were, uh, Huey P. Newton was talking about imperialism. And imperialism is the problem. Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of these artists realize that. And um, I'm down for for anybody trying to make a change it doesn't matter what their ethnicity is or whatever and there is no label to me you know if you're trying to make a change trying to make uh open people's eyes and, and and pass that knowledge then i'm with it you know awesome for sure i'm with that too man so what it, just i guess one last question you got any any words of advice any uh 
words of wisdom or as far as solution, positive things for those people out there who, you know, I heard you earlier, one of your songs talking about getting lost in the rabbit holes. And I think, you know, most of the audience will probably identify with that in some way. When you first start waking up to a lot of the world, you can just go down and just do mad research and exactly. you, you can get lost in that. And I've, I've seen a lot of people get lost in that in the sense that they get stuck in the fear and they just think it's hopeless. You know, there's nothing, there's no way to fix anything. So, you know, any, uh, anything positive, any, any solutions, ideas in that front? Man, you know, uh, it's I don't to be honest with you I, I feel like I don't have the answers I, I'm be, I'm gonna be real I don't think my mind is that mind to come up with the answer I don't feel like I'm that person and I don't think I'll have that before I die um, but what I do try to focus on is spreading uh, the knowledge and spreading the truth and I think that's something that I can do you know and I focus on that I, I my gift is uh, writing poetry uh, for, uh, spe uh, you know speech um, and I take that that gift of writing and freedom of speech and I just try to pass that on to the, uh, the next generation so as far as falling down the rabbit hole I think it's inevitable you're gonna follow down you're gonna fall down this rabbit hole if you start looking into things. Um, what what the the true uh, answer, in my opinion, is is uh, whatever you come to the conclusion of that that is uh, what what should be. That is what should have happened. Uh, so uh, therefore, whatever rabbit hole you fall down, um, you know that was meant to be and meant to happen. And I hope uh, internally you find that peace. You know, and that's really where Just I find your own truth. Find you know? your own truth. That, I mean, that's really all I have to say I couldn't tell you what is right or wrong I could just tell you that they're lying about a lot of shit <laughs> there's a lot of lies out there you know what I mean so where can people find I mean you put out an album right yeah like I put out, I've put out a lot of albums in my life uh, the last three albums I feel are my best albums uh, most recently is um, my favorite album it's called Thought Criminal kind of a spoof off the 1984 George Orwell uh, Thought Crime um, and then uh, uh, before that uh, my album was Bottom of the Pyramid uh, because I started feeling like that's where everyone resides is the bottom of the pyramid and then before that was my conviction and i'm working on a lot of new stuff i'm gonna have a lot of music uh in my 30s i'm living my 30s like it was my 20s you know 30s is the new 20s that's what i'm th that's what i'm saying <laughs> awesome so uh where where can we download or check, oh, yeah, check you on youtube yeah you can go to my videos. website uh, uh what my movement is it's the, it's the relisha the revolution militia that's r-i-l-i-t-i-a relisha.com um and that is also an acronym it stands for revolution is living in the insides of all and I truly believe that uh, and you can download my album for free off of my website relisha.com you can find me on my soundcloud soundcloud.com uh, backslash Fetty Profound um, and you can and you can download all my music off there as well we're gonna get this last track and I'll leave you guys alone hope you guys are having a good time out there most important thing in this life is family and friends and all this stuff is really not that important. Love. I can still remember the first time I picked up a pen Such an interesting concept, living through context I used to write rhymes just to leave this world Escape for a minute from the hate that was in it But all of a sudden it was hard to see And distinguish between what was written and me Reality tends to be what you make it to be So I'm lost in depression, soon to learn a lesson Pen in control of my past and my present All I need to do is rewrite my scripture But can't find a vision to repaint my picture so what have i become can i be free from my mind rip a page write a rhyme everything is fine can i still be real if every line is a lie will i actually die if i say i want to die well till the day of my demise it's gonna be my pen and i with pen and i I can still remember the first time I met my wife I glanced in her eyes and saw the love of my life She ain't know it, I ain't show it Just another interaction From two lost souls that were passing through traffic Could this really end up in love that's everlasting? Or will this end up another heartbroken disaster? One year, two year, three years pass Either she's the one or time's just moving fast It's a combination of both Getting harder to cope with the thought of her leaving Thought of me being 
One against the world just feels uneven Me without my girl, will my heart keep beating? She's the only one there and the only one who cares The only reason left to write a rhyme or say a prayer Until the day of my death, she gon' be right here And I'ma be right there to provide for my wife and I And we're just so close I remember the moment the nurse placed in my arms I vouched to myself I would never see her harmed And never do her wrong, I will never be gone I'm a father to a daughter that's forever a bond I'ma be a best friend in this life for advice Give her anything she wants regardless of the price And anything she needs she can come and see me Cause everything I need is for her to be pleased I'll be the crutch to hold her up when things get rough I'll be the first man to teach about love and trust If a man says he loves you that's never a Enough. He needs to prove it with his actions, it's more than just lust Baby girl, uh, I promise you this As long as the earth twists and my soul exists My love for my firstborn will always persist So even after I die, you can listen to this And know that we're just, know that we're just, we're just so close
What's up everyone, this is Derek.